should be live now in just a second. Okay, we should be live, everybody. Um, I'm just um, letting you, everybody know who's currently in the call that we are going live now. Um, so if you prefer not to have your name and your camera, if you're going to turn your camera on and your name, then feel free to join via the YouTube link that I've just put into the chat. And I'm just going to give a few minutes just so people can log on here. It should be live now on YouTube. Um, I should be seeing that now. Okay, so I'm just going to head to LinkedIn, just let people know that we're now live at 1.30 and we're going to have our first speaker um, coming on in just a little second there. So hopefully they've got the right link. Yes, they have the right link. Excellent. I can see myself live as well. Okay, everybody. So welcome to um, welcome to Legally Empowered, Navigating Your Journey Through Law. I'm Faith Brunel and I'm the CEO of Faith Brunel's Insights. Now, don't worry if you can't attend the whole call today. This call will be recorded via YouTube, via my YouTube channel, Faith Brunel's Insights, so, which I will show in just a short second. So if you're unable to actually um, attend all of the call today, then do not worry, do not despair. Um, I actually will, it will be live. I've got someone joining me as well. Uh, welcome as well and good afternoon. Okay, so um, the just again, we're just going to wait a few more minutes just to, allow, let, just to allow people to just trickle in and then they've got commitments and we've got our first speaker coming in in just a little while. But I wanted to set a little bit of context with some slides just before we started that. So I'm just going to bear with me, everybody. I'm just going to um, just reshare something here. Okie dokie, we posted your thoughts live now. Right, everybody. So welcome, as I said, welcome everybody who's just trickling in and joining us on the stream to Legally Empowered, Navigating Your Journey Through Law. I'm just going to give a little copy here and head back to my home page. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy. I hope you've had a wonderful week so far. I'm just copying the link for anybody who is struggling at the moment just to join. <clears throat> OK, and without further ado, we'll start because we've got our first speaker logging on in just a second. So as you can see, Legally Empowered, Navigating Your Journey to Law. This is a free online event. Welcome all with a headline sponsor of Logos. So Logos is a um, it's called Logos West Midland CIC. It is a CIC company, um, although my dad is currently not able to speak today as he's in another country. But I will do my best to talk a little bit about Logos and set a little bit of context about what Logos is and what they do as well. So I want to talk a little bit about Faith Brunel's insights and Logos because Logos is a key sponsor. So Logos West Midland CIC is a social enterprise, which is for those who from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds and what Logos CIC, West Midlands CIC offers is a weekly tuition school um, we offer we, we offer tuition classes that we um, that we charge for, and they are we get we offer them throughout the week or on a Saturday in person. And this is basically in line with the national curriculum, and we do from key stage one all the way up to A level. And if you're needing any university studies as well, that is something we can accommodate. We also cover adult learners, and so that's a little bit about Logos and um, West Midlands High School. But feel free, as I said, I will put the link um, into the chat now for Logos with Midland CIC, who is our key sponsor today. So thank you. I'm going to enter that into the YouTube chat. And I'm also going to enter that into the Google Meet chat for those who are currently on the Google Meet. So without further ado, let's just kind of breeze through a little bit before we have our first speaker, Sandy Monroe, who is a property lawyer who will be coming on in just a short while to give a little bit of context and talk a little bit about her journey. So let's go through these slides that I prepared today. So about us, about Faith Brunel's insights, and please let me know if you can slide oh got someone joining sandy monroe uh okay excellent so sandy's just going to be speaking in just a short while but let me just continue with the context okay hi sandy i'm just going to continue with the context and then i'll hand over to you <coughs> excuse me in just a short while okay so about faith brunel's insights i want to talk a little bit about faith brunel's insights initially just to give you all some context and information faith brunel's insights is again a social enterprise as well and we are your dedicated space for personal and professional growth and don't worry i'm not going to read out everything on the slide because it can be quite long but um in short what we do is we have podcast episodes, video podcast episodes every Thursday at 12 p.m. GMT. And that is via the YouTube channel where this is currently being um, streamed through as well. We do online events just like this one today. We do live wisdom talks. We give out tips for studies and we sell resources on the Core Now method and other study methods as well. And I actually, as founder, as the founder, I actually do um, speaking engagements as well. So I'm going to take a slight sip of water now. 
Okay, excellent. So that's what we do. And feel free to follow us at Faith Breed Insights on Instagram. And I'll give you all the QR codes and links as well. And this image here is just an image for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is just the image for our podcast, which is live on Spotify, Amazon Music, um, Apple Podcasts, etc. every Thursday. Okay, about me, as you can see, you're probably thinking, who is she? Who am I? Um, I'm Faith Brunel. I am the founder of Faith Brunel's Insights. I'm a 21-year-old politics graduate from King's College London, and I'm currently undertaking a law um, a law master's conversion um, to become a barrister. So about me, I founded Faith Brunel's Insights in 2020 when I'd moved to London in the midst of the pandemic, might I add, um, and I had to kind of wait, I had to navigate through, um, you know, through moving to another city, navigate through moving to another culture as well, and having to kind of, to kind of learn kind of the rules of engagement um, to be at university. And actually, so I've um, interviewed a range of guest speakers, I've, I've interviewed the founder of the NBCC Awards, Zoe Bennett, I've interviewed um, Professor Nan Menon, I've, I've interviewed Kishma Balaji, Justice Williams, MBE. I've also interviewed the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Director, Raiding Cards, and so many more very interesting people. So if you are interested, do head again to Faith Brunel's Insights, um, just here on the right in the logo, and head over there. And as you can see, this is my uh, this is my signature, Faith Brunel, and the photograph that my mum very nicely took for me back in 2020. And little did I know that it, it would actually become my podcast image and the image that people recognise me. Every time they see me, they're like, oh, oh, that's the white shirt. I'm like, yes, that's the white shirt that's become um, so um, known to people now when I'm talking about the podcast. I, I think that's what comes through first. It's the white shirt when I've got my hands like this slightly. Okay. So let me, before I hand over to Sandy Munro, I'm going to actually do a little bit more of context here. I want to just run you through my brief journey as founder of FBI. Again, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but Faith Brunel's Insight. So again, as we all usually do, I started at primary school, St. Teresa's Primary School. I then moved to Ashbaston High School for Girls. Um, I then moved to King's Edwards College in Stourbridge. Then I went to King's College London, and I'm now at BPP University. That's a little whistle stop tour of my education. Um, these are a few of our resources. Um, a lot of people are quite, it does pique their interest when we talk about these resources. So I thought, let me add some nice images. So the first one, it's not an event, it's a journey. That is our underlying foundation. That is our mantra. That is what really pushes us in terms of our ethos and our values for FBI. And that is available in notebook form or in corner method form. One in the middle of the notebook. Then we have be brave, be bold, be strong. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that one there is basically, again, it's another mantra as well that I really found helpful while I was navigating through my challenges, let's say, at university. So that's that as well. Then we have other generic notebooks as well. Another one, be brave, be bold, be strong. You may ask, why is it there twice? Well, one is actually a Cornell method style, which is a style of note taking. And the other one is a linear style. And just, just for a little bit of clarification, really, a linear style is those lines that we all use for note taking. And the Cornell method style is basically a different way of making notes. It's where we have that grid. And that grid is basically segmented into different parts. And um, basically, that's what the Cornell method really is. <laughs> Excuse, bear with me because um, my voice for some reason has decided to go funny, but I know that God will bring me through in terms of continuing to set this context that we need. So yeah, that's the Cornell method. I wanted to show you a brief image, just quickly pan to Google. That's the Cornell method there. That's what we do. That's what we sell as one of the interiors as well. So hopefully you can kind of see that. I'm going to head back to my slides now just, for con just to continue where we were. OK, so a few more generic notebooks as well um, with these lovely florals, because I said, as again, it really does depend on what someone's looking for when it comes to note taking. Um, again, so this is uh, Ignite the Change, so Ignite the Courage, and we also have one called Ignite the Change, uh, and that is a mind map notebook, um, and that is available via Amazon, and be you, be confident, be happy. We also have other ones that, you know, called, called Unleash the Boldness, Unleash the Courage, and these are all available by Amazon, so you can scan the QR code below, or you can just head to Amazon or to our Etsy, and you can make a purchase if that's something that you are interested in today as well. So I know that a lot of people have been asking me to share my resources. So here we are. Um, as I said, I will just now type the links into both chats because we are currently live on YouTube. So I will send the link into the Google Meet chat now. So those should receive it in just a second. 
and I will also paste the link into the YouTube chat because we are currently live at the moment. Okay, excellent. All right, so without further ado, let's just move forward. So again, these are just a few images really of people, I'm just gonna charge my laptop, people who I've actually interviewed. So we've got Professor Nan Menon, Justice, um, we've got Justice Williams, MBE. We've got um, here, Dr. Beverly Lindsay, Kishma Balaji and Radian Carter. These are just a few to note. Um, yes, and one really important thing I wanna get across to you today, as you hear from our range of speakers, I just want to inform you that you can actually re-watch all of the sessions on YouTube after this for many years to come via um, the Faith Brunel's Insights channels. You can see the screenshot here as well, where we actually do publish our podcast. Um, I actually do um, kind of other playlists as well on how to study, how to revise it. That is something that really piques your interest. So now, just a briefly before I hand over to Sandy, um, I want to talk a little bit about some note-taking tips because at an event like this, it is very, very important that you jot a few notes down or jot a few words down or something that a speaker has mentioned that you really find is interesting, that really just speak to your situation or speak to your uh, career path. So we've looked at the Cornell method, we've got the linear method, which is the lines, mind mapping, and then we had the Eisenhower matrix. So the Eisenhower matrix was created by President Dwight Eisenhower and really just speaks about another way of kind of managing your note taking as well, where it splits in it splits your kind of um, work into four quadrants. And I'll just grab a, an image here, it should be on the screen. I'm going to go for this one by look the four here. I'm just going to click on this one make it a little bit bigger and this basically says um, tasks that you want to do, tasks you want to decide, tasks you want to delegate and tasks you want to delete and so that is just an alternative note-taking method that you can actually employ so that is that as well. So without further ado I'm going to switch back to my slides and I'm going to introduce the first speaker who is Sandy Munro who is a property lawyer. I'm going to leave the screen up Sandy while you speak so that people know what you're talking actually about for a little bit of context. So Sandy heading, uh, handing over to you and then after Sandy I will then take back the floor and open for any Q&A and then um, I will carry on. So Sandy you've got until about 1.55 just 10 or so minutes just to please give us a lovely um, context about what you're doing. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you, Fee. So I'm. I um, can't hear you, Sandy. Sandy actually, you know. I'm not sure if it's me. Let me just... Oh, you're not hearing. Uh, just slight audio. Don't worry. That's why we oh. have extra time. You're actually two minutes ahead of schedule, so you've got that time to. Can, can you hear me any better no, now? No, I can't. It might help to disconnect your earpiece because that happened to me today, and I had to plug in my okay. microphone for my podcasting. Uh, and hopefully that will no oh, that's weird i can't hear you um you can, can you hear me no i can't hear you oh okay i think my i think no? my sister just let me know that she can hear so it might just be me oh be can you laptop. hear me now because i have now disconnected the headphones. okay one second let me just check the youtube everybody bear with me a second i want to make sure i can hear sandy's talk as well of course <laughs> All right, Sandy, it's me. Um, my mom just also told me that she can okay. hear you as well. So, Sandy, over okay, to you. Good. I will listen through the YouTube. So, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Faith. Um, so, yes, yeah, Faith said, I, my name is Sandy Munro. I have been a property lawyer for uh, over 35 years now, I think, um, and actually happened upon, um, happened upon law altogether, let alone up on property law because I always had intended to be um, specifically a paediatrician for as long as I can remember. Um, but then when I started my A-levels, um, I hated applied maths. And um, at that time, I was lucky enough that we had careers advisors. So I went to my careers advisor saying, you know, I just don't, I can't cope with applied maths at all. It just did, did not seem to have any bearing on maths. And at the time, I had to do it to um, become a doctor. So she looked at my grades and suggested that I perhaps switch to law. Um, so then I started um, studying law. I did my law O level alongside my law A level because we had to have three A levels at the time in English and history. Um, but I started my journey as a legal executive because that's what my careers advisor had advised at the time. So this was like 88. 
Um, and then on qualification, I well, once I'd finished my studying, my formal studying for my ILEX exams, I then found out that I couldn't actually become a legal executive because I was too young. Because, so at the time they had a bar, you had to be 25. So I started working at Eversheds at that time as a legal executive, realized I was doing the same work as a solicitor, but being paid akin to a secretary. And because I couldn't formally have the legal executive title, I thought, well, I might as well just carry on studying um, up to the age of 25 when I could get the ILEX title, by which time I had then got a full exemption from my um, from a law degree. So I then went and did a year full time as and did my legal practice course and came back as a newly qualified solicitor in um i think that was 90 i'm trying to remember it's so long ago i that um that was 1997 i think by the time i had qualified as a solicitor and that was my introduction into law but when i went to Eversheds, um they had put me in property and that was um yeah that was the start for me which i think looking back was probably a good area of law for me to get into because I am quite um, black and white and I'm not quite sure that I would have fared very well as a um, criminal lawyer or a family lawyer because I would get, I suspect, too invested in my clients and um, it would have possibly an emotional impact on me. So um, yeah, property law that is very black and white. This is the rule, even though you do have to um, apply some commercial com commercial realism to it, um, actually did suit my personality. And I have been doing that ever since. Um, and I've done all aspects of property law. So and I, I don't know um, if anybody knows, but effectively we have residential property lawyers and we have commercial property lawyers. Most of us will come across residential property lawyers when we're buying a flat, buying a house, um, whereas commercial property lawyers do exactly kind of as it says on the tin. So we act for um, commercial entities who are wanting to get into property. So throughout my career, I have acted for retailers taking leases of stores. I've acted for developers buying land to either put industrial units on or they're buying land for house building so that they can then sell. And for the last 15 years, I've acted for public sector clients. So that's NHS trusts and local authorities doing all aspects of their property work. And that has tended to be a mix of disposing of assets because they have had a squeeze on funding so disposing of excess assets um regearing and in fact just re-engineering their estates so they would buy um land or either downsize put new buildings on um buying shopping centers and regenerating those and also managing um landlord and tenant issues where they're granting leases or taking leases easements the whole kind of gambit of um property work so that is me in a nutshell. So I'm going to end there in case there are any questions. But if anybody wants to um, reach me or reach out to me, I am on LinkedIn. Excellent, Sandy. That's actually one second. Sorry. Actually one second. Sorry. Right, apologies. I've actually just realised that for some reason um, my audio works mm. when I actually log on as myself, but through the um, account that I'm actually streaming it from, my audio has gone funny. So I have to fix that in the break. <laughs> but thank you, Sandy, very much for um, speaking about your journey. It was very, very interesting, even though I've had to listen to it um, partly through YouTube and partly through another Google Meet, but hopefully we'll get that sorted. Trust in God and he'll make a way for you. So thank you very much, Sandy, for stepping in really and speaking really, mm -hmm. in, you know, really in depth about your journey. It's really, really interesting. And I, I, I and I I really know that people would have benefited from it. But Sandy, if you can just tell the listeners today and those tuning in how they can contact you to have any other further questions, that'd be great. Yeah, so at the moment, I'm a um, consultant partner at a firm called David Jones Bold. And so if you look me up on LinkedIn, Sandy Munro, um, you will find me there. You can contact me through there and send a message via LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the easiest way to contact me. 
or um, I'm trying to so my email work address is sandy.munro at djblaw.co.uk. Again, if you just um, yeah look up djb, um, you'll find me there. Sandy, I didn't get any of that, but I know everybody <laughs> else did. Um, oh, thank sorry. You <laughs> no, sorry, it's not you, it's me. It's actually my technology. You didn't which hear is why it, I but... always make the joke and say technology sometimes doesn't rely on you. So actually, everybody, I'm going to give everybody, thank you, Sandy, very much. If nobody has any questions at this moment, as Sandy just mentioned, those are the ways in which you can contact us. So, Sandy, I'll let you go, but thank you for very gracefully stepping in last minute. You've really been a gem. Thank you so very much. Thank That's you. That's all right. Thanks all. Bye. 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 Okay, everybody, so thank you to everybody. And those who are aware, I'm having some slight technical um, difficulties. So what I'm going to do, everybody, I'm going to give you all just a five-minute break until about 1.57, where I'm just going to fix my audio and um, come back. So I'm just going to share my screen of a break slide. So please uh, don't disappear. I'm just going to fix my audio so that when the next speaker comes, who, who is Michelle Knight, uh, before that we have Paul, but when the next speakers come on, I will actually be able to hear and to engage with them. So I'm just going to sort out that audio and be back with you in just a short while. Thanks, everybody. Right, this should still be streaming. I don't know if it's still streaming. Yes, okay. Um, I, but I'm just going to ask my sister to just kindly um, talk so I can see if I can hear anybody before this next speaker arrives. Bethany, could you kindly just unmute? And I've put you on the spot, but... <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Oh, can you hear thank me? you, Jesus. Yes, thank you. That's Brilliant. actually, thank you, Jesus. Right. Okay, everybody, I'm set. I'll still give you a break, but I had some technical difficulties where... I had to just remain calm and resolve in God. Right, so I put my break slide up. And I should still be streaming. I'm just going to just make sure I'm still streaming. Am I still live? Ah, oh, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Fabulous. Excellent. So, everybody, thank you very much to Sandy, although I didn't really get to hear a lot of it, but I did um, tune in via YouTube, which, thank God, I've got YouTube as a backup. So that is where we are at the moment. The next speaker, actually, we're going to hear from briefly is Paul McConnell, who is the head of global engagement at Birmingham Law School when we come back from our break. Um, and he's just going to speak briefly on the UCAS applications to university um, for law, um, for the Birmingham Law School. So that's what's going to happen in just a short while. So that's where we are. And I'm just going to um, put that up in just a couple of minutes, but enjoy your break.
Okay, everybody, I hope you had a wonderful break. We are now back. Okay, everybody, so um, the next speaker just briefly was pre-recorded. Um, and I, for those who tuned in last year will realise that we actually had this talk last year, but it's still very relevant. This is, this is from the Head of Global Engagement at Birmingham Law School. And this is for applying with UCAS. So I'm just going to have a few minutes of that before our next speaker. But I just wanted to give you all a little bit of context about the application process. So please let me know, if those in the chat, if you can hear. I'm now going to switch, um, share my screen screen um and oh slight error let's not hopefully this will just work i'm just going to log us all in and then the next speaker we have oh we've got an, an addition yes you can hear thank you lovely okay oh it's gone into full screen back so. oh gosh everybody my laptop has decided to go a little funny but we move okay i'm going to play this audio now Connell, and I'm an associate professor specialising in law at University of Birmingham Law School. If you're not familiar with the University of Birmingham, you can see a picture of our campus on the slide at the start of this presentation. We're one of the top 100 universities in the world and one of the founder members of the prestigious Russell Group of Universities. We offer a very wide range of subjects from my own subject law through to medicine, social sciences, business, science and so forth. I'd like to begin just by saying a huge thank you to Faith Brynell for organising this fantastic event, which I know will be really useful for everyone who attends. I'm very sorry that I can't be there to deliver live in person to you. I'm working overseas this week and with the time zone difference and work commitments here, unfortunately, I'm not able to present live. But I hope that you'll find this brief presentation for 15 minutes or so to be helpful. So let's begin with a little bit of information about UCAS, which I'm sure you'll have heard of. It's the organisation that you apply to university through. But how does it work exactly? On one simple online application form, you can apply for up to five different universities, and we would recommend that most students use all five choices, even though there will obviously be some within that five that you're more keen on than others. You fill in all of your details, you provide a personal statement, and your teacher will also then provide a reference which will include predicting your grades in your current course of study that would typically be a levels but of course it could be inter international baccalaureate or, or btech or other alternatives as well the deadlines for doing this are really important if you, if you miss what we call the first deadline it's very unlikely that you would get a place at one of your preferred universities if you're applying for the most prestigious programs and prestigious institutions. The application deadlines are October for medicine, dentistry and veterinary science and for everything else it's in January and, and do pay very close attention to those deadlines as I said. You submit your application and then you wait to hear back from your institution. There may be some further steps in the process required. That would certainly be the case for medicine or dentistry. You'd, you'd be looking at um, interviews and um, aptitude tests and so on as well. For a small number of law schools, not my own, there is also an aptitude test that you would need to complete. And as part of your research of investigating different programmes and universities, you can look at the, the specific requirements to apply. For most institutions, though, and for most programmes, it's sufficient just to complete your UCAS application and wait and sit back and see what comes out of it. Now, each university is going to review your application. And what will they be looking at? First of all, they'll be looking at those students that applied in time. That's why it's really important, as I said, that you apply by the first deadline if you're applying to a prestigious course or, or university. They will also look at the reference and your predicted grades. And that's usually the starting point, seeing that a student meets the academic standard for a program. So when you're looking at programmes, you do need to research the entry requirements and be realistic. 
think about your academic performance to date and what grades you think it's likely that you will get. For instance, if you're being predicted high grades, then of course look at programmes with high entry requirements. If your predicted grades are likely to be a bit lower, it would probably be a wasted choice to apply for an institution asking for very high grades for programmers you are unlikely to receive an offer if your teacher is not predicting you grades that meet the entry requirements. So that aspect of researching the programmes, researching the entry requirements is very important before you make your applications on UCAS. Just to go back to UCAS, what happens next, as I said, is that you wait and see. The institution will decide if they want to offer you a place. In a best case scenario, you'll end up with, with five offers for all five institutions if you've chosen those appropriately with regard to appropriate entry requirements. You then have a bit of time to think about your offers and you choose your two preferred offers. One is called your firm choice. The other is your insurance choice. Now, if all goes well and you get your A-level grades and you meet the entry requirements of the firm choice, that's where you're going. If things didn't quite go as well as hoped, you may not be successful in retaining your place at your firm choice. That would be a decision that they would make. But you may then be taken on by your insurance choice, which typically would be asking for slightly lower entry requirements, so long as you meet the requirements that they're asking for. So that's how the process works. And hopefully you're sensing the starting point, of course, is entry requirements and achieving good academic grades that meet the requirements for your course. What's really important as well, though, is your personal statement. Every applicant by UCAS has to complete a personal statement. And you can see some quotes on the slides there from admissions tutors at University of Birmingham saying they use it to select between applicants. It's especially important in borderline cases. And that, that certainly is the case. If there's a bit of uncertainty about a particular candidate, if there's a shortage of places on a programme, a personal statement will become very important and the admissions tutor will be looking closely to see who has put forward the strongest case for why they're a suitable student for the course. Excellent. So thank you um, to Paul. As I said, I'll just briefly play Paul's talk from last year, which still is relevant today. Just before our next speaker, Michelle Knight um, has joined us now. So hi, Michelle. Welcome. I'm going to Hello. hand over to you to introduce yourself. Do you want me to pop your slides up now for you? Oh, yes, please. That's really helpful. Oh, no problem. So everyone, just bear with me a second, everybody. I'm just going to grab Michelle's slide that she kindly sent me yesterday. Let's have a look. Michelle. Oh, will I be able to, if they are, if they are, slideshow, let me see if I can, there so everyone, I'm just going to, so what I'm going to do, Michelle, I'm just going to continue playing Paul's talk while I find this, and then I will just switch it over, everybody, okay, so that's, that's a little bit of context, so we just continue that for a bit. So let's talk about the personal statement. What sort of things would you be looking to cover on that? So there's quite a lot of detail on that slide there. I won't go through it all, but the starting point is why you're applying for that subject and what you hope to do in the future, your career goals and what you hope to gain from the subject. Also important to focus on your experiences, your personal qualities and emphasise your commitment and motivation to your chosen course of study. Picking out the most important ones, I, I've probably hinted at that already, but the, the reason why you're choosing a subject is key. What you can bring, your relevant personal skills and qualities and your motivation and commitment, I would see, I might say, are my top three areas that I'm looking at when I consider a personal statement. Now, before you start writing your personal statement, it's important to think about what skills are important to do well in a subject because they will differ from subject to subject. I've given you an example on this slide for law. These are all the... Okay, so thank you to Paul. And for those who were just tuning in there, feel free to read these key skills to do well in law. What I will do, because Paul's talk was popular last year, I will repost that onto our YouTube channel via Faith Bernal's Insights. So now I'm going to hand over to Michelle. I'm going to share her, her slides now. So let me just grab the window. And Michelle, over to you. Once it should pop up now, let me know if you can see it. I'll put it on large. Hang on, let me just mute my mic before that so you don't have any technical um, interruptions. Over to you, Michelle. 
Great. Well, I have to say, thank you so much, Faye, for having me. And I really believe this is a really important um, discussion that needs to take place. And I, I really hope that the people who are listening in will find this an encouragement in their career legal journey. Um, I have only done a few slides. I've tried to keep it quite brief. Um, but my talk is all about navigating legal excellence and parenthood. Um, but before I jump into that, I just thought it's probably best to give you a brief background about who am I. So I am a legal director at DWF, and DWF is a leading global provider of integrated legal and business services. And we deliver that through integrated services on a global scale, so we're across the world. And we have three offerings, which is legal services, legal operations and business services. I sit in the legal services business. I am a qualified solicitor and I am now, oh, I don't even know if I should say, about 16 years qualified as a solicitor. Um, and I specialize in regeneration for public sector clients. I work in a national team and I manage my direct line reports, which is also senior associates, associates, solicitors, paralegals and trainees across numerous offices in England. Um, my day job consists of leading complex commercial development projects. So I'm a property lawyer, but I specialise in commercial development. And that ranges from everything from regeneration of town centres, new shopping centres, um, large scale infrastructure projects, so new roundabouts, um, new uh, railway lines and the like, um, as well as compulsory purchase. So I help um, public sector clients acquire land for development. Um, my projects last for quite a long time, on average five to ten years for one scheme. And also um, it takes a long time and I have a lot of colleagues who support me in managing the projects that I have. I am recognised in the Legal 500, which is a ranking for lawyers across the country um, of the most cutting edge and innovative lawyers um, at that time and I'm also a leader in my business but as well as that I am married to my husband Dean and we have three boys all under the age of 10 between 5 and 10 and I am a co-chair of a, of a national charity as well so that's a bit about me and my background and I, I always say um, I'm on LinkedIn um, if you want to connect with me please do so to continue the conversation Faith next slide please Great. So I've, I've said all that bit. I think I've, I've ran ahead of myself. So go on again, please. Thank you. So when I think about my legal career over the last, um, I suppose I had a traditional route. I did a law degree. I took a year out. Then I did my LPC. Then I became a paralegal for a year. Then I did my training contract. And I've been working in the profession ever since then. So I had a traditional route. Um, but for the last 20 years in navigating my career progression, and I don't know how much you are aware of the legal profession, but there is there is a hierarchy, not only dependent on the number of years of qualification that you have, but also as you go through uh, and get promotions. So it ranges from partner, and there's different levels of partners, right the way down to paralegals. Um, and I've gone quite through a number of um, levels and tiers to get to the position that I have now um, and one of the things that I've always found important in terms of navigating my career is considering what is important to me so the next few slides are the four considerations that I've had to think about as I develop and progress in my career whilst also being a working mum and what that looks like on a daily basis and I have these things at the forefront of my mind because it helps me to navigate um, the working the working week, the working day, and also where I want to go, but also to make sure the things that are important to me actually also occur. So the first one is values and vision. I'm very clear about my values and my priorities. Central to my values is my family, and I place a significant amount of weight and responsibility upon myself in the importance of raising my children to be the best version of themselves. And I believe in order for them to do that, I have to be present, um, not only physically present with them when they're at home, but also I need to be present as in engaging in the conversations with them, engaging in their activities, 
interacting with them on an, on an emotional, mental level, as well as everything else, and also making sure that they have the right opportunities for the stage they're at. And so that does mean sometimes on a weekend, as well as being a leader um, during the week, I'm a taxi driver at the weekend, taking my children to whatever parties it is that they need to go to. But because I have that vision, it then helps me to think about what does my value system look like? What does my work need to look like to make sure that I can achieve both in my career and most importantly as a parent? So you need to decide what is important for you and literally write down what is your vision? What are your values? And have them somewhere that you can see them. So when you're making decisions um, in your workplace, in your career, you know what the backdrop to that looks like and what is important to you. And by you doing that, it helps you to go on to the next thing, which is boundaries. And it's really important in a, in a corporate context. Now, I, I have a working day, but I also have an iPhone. We also have Teams chat um, and the working day has been extended. So where traditionally when I was when I became into law, it was a nine to five, roughly. The day has been extended and because of the pandemic that became even worse where people were sort of emailing all through the night and expecting responses immediately. So it's really important that you have boundaries to protect you and your work and what you're trying to achieve. And the best way to start that is to have values and vision to help you work out what those boundaries are. So boundaries for me means the limit of what is acceptable to me. What are the things that I won't, what are red lines for me that I won't go over in terms of my work, which may impact my family life? Um, and the best way that I like to think about it is not a, what are the positive boundaries, but what would work look like for me if I didn't have boundaries? So, for example, I could possibly take on workload that, that is meant for others, but I take it on because I don't have any boundaries carrying out work which does not actually support my career to progression and development it's really important that you are constantly looking forward as to where you want your to, your career to go and having the right opportunities that build you along that road of what you're trying to achieve and if you're doing work that doesn't support that even though you're working hard it is of no benefit to you for your future in terms of work making sure that i have work that aligns with my personal life I need to have flexibility at work that I can go to the school plays, that I can go to sports day, that I can go to parents evening, that whole thing again about being present. And so I need to make sure I have a boundaries around my calendar, that the things that are important to me go in there first before the additional client meetings that I have to have. I don't like to have blurring because if you blur around when you when you start work when you finish work and when you have your personal life it can become even more difficult to understand well when what is my finishing time and what do i need to do to be productive during those hours um, and also i also like to think if i don't have boundaries i wouldn't have productive and mutually beneficial working relationships it's really important that the people that i connect with at work that i'm able to support them and bless them in the work that they're doing but it's mutually beneficial to me so therefore i'm very strategic in terms of the relationships that i have and i also have boundaries around the number of days that i work i don't work five days a week because i i have life admin and i have children and i have a husband and i have myself that i need to protect so therefore i work a, a, a condensed working week um i have a boundary around the number of hours that i work a day I have a boundary around the number of hours sleep that I have a day. So I have the energy to actually do the things that I want to do and need to achieve. Um, I really think it's really important that you discuss your boundaries at work in the work context with your colleagues and your, your line manager to make sure there's an understanding of your commitment to the business, but your commitment to things outside of the business and how that's going to look. Um, I am very key because I have a, a large team that I work with that I delegate. It's something that's really important to me that I delegate and supervise appropriately my colleagues who are supporting me on my projects, that they get the career development that they require. But it also means on my non-working day that I have confident, 
competent staff who are able to smoothly work with my clients when I'm not around to continue to deliver the work in my absence. Um, I have a, a boundary around mental load that I write everything down because then it frees up my mind to be able to focus on the task and deliver on the task that's ahead of me rather than having to continuously worry about all the things that I need to do. So that's boundaries. But what I'd also like to say is we have a term work-life balance. And um, for me, I've, I've never understood what that means. Work-life balance and balance in general to me, I think of the scales and, you know, they're, they're at the same level, equilibrium all the time. And from my personal experience in, in as a senior leader in law, um, balance doesn't happen because you have commitments with clients, you have transactional deadlines, but then you also have the child that's ill at school, you have the play that you need to attend, and sometimes you just want to have downtime for yourself. So I don't believe there's work-life balance. And what I prefer to call it is a rhythm. So the, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. And over the course of um, the period, I, I tend to look at it in terms of a month, um, make sure that I've, I've given enough to each areas of my life to make sure I've got the right rhythm to support me in what I'm trying to deliver. And I have to say, and I always say it, um, I have to give respect where respect is due. I have a very supportive husband who very much believes in equal share, equal load. And in fact, he does a lot of the school run um, during the day to help me, support me in terms of getting my hours that I need to do for my business. Um, and I also have a very supportive external family, my parents, my husband, my in-laws and uh, friends and family who also support. And you need that if you're going to be a senior leader in the workplace, but you also want to have a family, you need a support system that's going to enable you to thrive. Next slide, please, Faith. And then one of the things I would say is really important when you're looking at firms is that you choose the right firm for you. So lots of firms will be telling you about how great they are, but you need to think about, is this the firm that suits what you need at this particular time in your life? It's really important that you speak to friends, allies, sponsors, others in your network who may have insight in terms of the firms that you are considering approaching um, to, to understand what exactly um, they have experienced of that practice. And also, it's really important that you think about what sort of practice you want to work in. I work in private practice in a global firm. That works for me. It might not work for others. You may want to be in-house. You may want to work in the third part, third sector. There's lots of different options in law, um, and they all have their pros and cons. So think about what would be right for you. I also think if you're a parent, it's important that you think about flexibility and flexible working practices, that whatever that firm offers, it suits whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, I would always say as well that you look at working families, top employers, because they have um, a top 30 list of the firms around, not just the firms, but organisations around the country that prioritise um, working families and have an assessment in terms of different um, flexibility and family friendly policies and practices that they have and they rate them, they rate the top 30. And when I was uh, thinking about moving to DWF, DWF was on that list. So I knew that I was coming to the right employer who would be able to support me in a work family balance or blend or rhythm as I like to call it. And also I work in quite a large team. As I mentioned before, I have a team that I can delegate to. So you need to consider about, well, what is the size of the team? Can they absorb the work that you need to do on your non-working day on, or however your flexibility is going to work to make sure that you are able to deliver for your clients as well as for yourself? Because delivery is the base point for progression. Um, if you're not delivering the work for your employer and for your clients, you're not going to progress. So therefore you need to also take that into consideration. And then finally, uh, which to me is always key, is self-care. Um, all the things that I've just said, I always have a caveat, which is that is the ideal. Um, go for ideal, not, not for perfection. 
every day of the week I can't always do my work day does not always look like that and some days I have good days sometimes I have bad days and we all have it but what I would always say to you is don't um, be too hard on yourself when the day is not perfect um, and have fun enjoy your work life enjoy your career and enjoy your family um, because you need to have downtime outside of work to actually be replenished to then deliver again the next time round. I also like to think as part of my self care that I have a I have a routine. I have a routine for the the work day. I have a routine for life at home, and those routines are really important and they're very bespoke to what I need and what my family needs. Top of that list is always sleep for me because I've got three boisterous boys who do lots of activities and my, me and my husband like to participate in it with them. So all I would say to you is when you're thinking about your career, think about your self-care, think about your values, think about your vision and all the things that I mentioned. And it is possible, it is possible to be an excellent um, leader, an excellent lawyer. Uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that I'm an excellent mother, but I hope my children, I, I love the, the, the benefits that I bring to them in their life. And it's easy to be able to progress, but you have to be intentional about it. So I, I'd say to you is um, do your best, always speak to others and be encouraged it is possible. Faith, back to you. Excellent, Michelle. I think I'm back on. Yes, excellent, Michelle. Thank you very much. You know, you know that was really, really inspiring and insightful. As you can see there, I was just nodding my head in unison, in agreement with you. Excellent, Michelle. And the way you presented it as well was so relatable, really concise. It was really, really insightful, really engaging as well. It kept me really listening. So thank you very much, Michelle, again for just really giving us a great overview about you, about your life, about about your kind of everything that you're doing. So thank you so much. And and just one question finally really if the listeners or the audience today you know if they'd like to contact you what's the best way to do that for them today um i'm on linkedin so michelle knight dwf um on linkedin please feel free to reach out to me i um I'm very much involved in early careers as well as in the dni mm -hmm. space so if you if you would like to connect with me you're more than i'm more than happy for you to do so excellent michelle thank you very much once again i can really 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 excited there that was really great a really great talk so thank you so much michelle and i hope you have a wonderful week and the wonderful rest of your day thank you so much thank you take care guys bye, bye. take care Excellent. So, so, so that was Michelle from DWF and she really gave us a great context there. So the next um, speaker really who is next, who should be logging on in just a second, is Suzanne Reese. I'm just going to put up, she's got her slides there as well. So I'm going to find her slides in advance. But Suzanne Reese is the founder of Inspired to Study and she should be joining us in just a second. So hopefully we'll just give her a few minutes to log on. Um, but in the meantime, you know, for those who have heard from Sandy so far and Michelle so far and Paul, if you are interested in anything that they said, and I really hope you are, then feel, please feel free to connect with them via LinkedIn as well. Um, and additionally, if you registered via LinkedIn today, you can actually click onto the speaker and connect with them there as well. So that is us so far. So I'm just going to grab Suzanne's slides and just make sure she is ready to join. Excellent. Let me just get her slides up. So I'm just going to put my show my screen as well. And also, everybody, those who are interested in, as I said, re-watching the event from today, then feel free to watch it through the Faith Brunel Insights channel. All speakers, again, as I said before, are available to be um, contacted via LinkedIn. So we have Sandy Monroe, Paul McConnell, and we have Michelle Knight as well. So I'm just going to... Can I start the slide showing this? Excellent. So I've got the I've got the slides here. I'm just going to download them. Excellent. So Suzanne is next. In the meantime, while we're waiting for Suzanne, um, for those who are still interested in what Paul was saying earlier, I'm just going to briefly just replay that, just so um, just so we're not sat in silence while we wait for Suzanne to continue. So let me just play this. 
sorts of attributes which are important for prospective law students. For instance, they have to enjoy reading. There's a lot of reading on a law degree. They have to have good... Refresh this. We had a slight media error. Let me just get back I'm to not... where we were. Of course, requirements is very important. Okay, that's where we they were. They have to have good written skills. They have to enjoy debate and analysis and so on. So sometimes a good place to start is think about the skills you're trying to demonstrate and then consider from your experiences how you can do that within your personal statement. Now here you can see a few examples of definitely how not to do a personal statement. Just reading through those, you can see that for an institute, those will not be convincing reasons why someone wants to study a subject and should be given a place. Instead, what we're looking for is something much more thought through with depth, explaining appropriately a student's interest in a topic and their commitment to that, that program. Obviously, you could pause the recording at this point and take a moment to read through that example. That, that's one for history. And as I say, they will vary from subject to subject, but hopefully you get the idea there needs to be some depth and some thought behind it. You can find lots of examples online of, of good personal statements and tips, but just a few key ones from me. Again, I'll pick out key points from, from this slide. The majority should be concentrating on course and subject related points rather than being very generic. Also, it's clearly essential that your grammar, spelling and vocabulary are strong for university level study. Strong written communication skills are very important. So you need to demonstrate that you have those skills in your statement. It's important not to rush your statement as well. They do take quite a bit of time to put together. We can usually spot those that are rushed as they're not well thought out and often continue. Excellent and welcome. We were just playing this in the interim while you were logging on and they had a few technical issues. So everybody, that was Paul. And I said again, um, I will continue to play Paul's talk throughout this if you have any breaks. Don't worry, Suzanne, if you've got some technical difficulties at the moment, I'll just keep talking while you figure that out. So the next speaker that I mentioned is Suzanne Reese. Uh, Suzanne, your microphone on mute should be, at, it should be at the bottom where it says, so it should say the time and at the bottom it should have a microphone there. I'll try and see if I can unmute you. No, I can't unmute you. Let's have a look. Just bear with us all a moment. I know I can't unmute you. Um, let's have a look. So at the bottom, you should have a panel. Uh, Suzanne, can you see where you've got the name of the event? and the times so it should say 230 fbi legally empowered have you got that strip if you just nod or indicate in the chat but if you do it's on that same it's the first icon there on the left Not to worry, Suzanne, as I said, I'll give you a few minutes. I'll just continue to, what I'll do, everybody, while Suzanne's just unmuting, I'll continue to play a little bit of Paul's talk so you can continue that and then I'll help Suzanne just to unmute her mic. Some errors as well. So trying to put it all together, what key tips would I be giving you as an applicant to university? First one is the grades. Work as hard as you can and get the highest possible grades because the higher your grades, the higher your predicted grades, the more options you will have in terms of entry requirements when it comes to applying for different courses. Next, if your grades seem on track and you found appropriate universities to apply to, do invest time in your personal statement. It needs to be a really good quality statement, particularly for competitive oh, courses or if your grades just at the right. Line excellent. So let's pause. Thank you, Paul, again for stepping in. OK, so let's pause, Paul. Suzanne, can you hear me? Suzanne? Uh, could you just... Uh, Quibben, I think your mic's on mute. If you could just mute your mic for us and welcome. That'd be great. I'm just going to hand over to Suzanne. OK, so then you can't hear me. Um, if you so if you have like headphones, if you don't have headphones or your laptop, you can just increase the volume. Um, let's have a look. If you just increase your volume on your laptop, that's the only 
best thing I can suggest from where I am to where you are. Okay, so sit down to have a few technical difficulties, everyone. So I'm just going to give us some time just to um, figure those out because I myself had technical issues today for those who were here from the beginning where I couldn't actually hear anything either. So what I'm going to do, as I said, we've got Suzanne and then we've got, after Suzanne, we have Corbena who actually joined as well. So welcome, Corbena. Um, I'm just going to give Suzanne a little bit more time just to really figure out kind of the technical issues. So I'm going to continue with Paul's talk uh, again, just for reference. Paul is the um, head of global engagement at Birmingham Law School, University of Birmingham. So let's continue this talk and then I'll give Suzanne a little bit more time. Requirements. Show your enthusiasm in your statement and also show your skills and qualities that you can bring. Finally, it's important to keep positive and focused. Not everything will go to plan in the process. Grades sometimes don't come out as predicted. Sometimes offers don't materialise from universities that you might really want to go through, but it's important to keep positive and focused. So what can you do where things don't go with plan, go to plan? Dealing with, with rejection and an ability to do that is very important. We, we all suffer knockbacks and, and plans that don't work out, but the best thing you can do is to quickly leave the original plan behind you and move on and find a plan B, which, which could be, for example, looking at a different university or a different programme or moving on to, to another course of, of action for yourself. But the quicker you can deal with rejection and move on, the better things will work out for you more quickly. Clearing is a process that's used by a lot of students when their grades don't quite work out. So, for example, if you didn't Hello. meet the entry requirements yes. by either your firm or insurance choice, you are likely to have to go through the clearing me, process to gain a place at a university. That takes place after A-level results day in the summer. Clearing could also be used by a student who hadn't applied by the original deadlines to get a place at the last minute. With regard to clearing, I should say that it won't be possible to gain places on all courses via clearing. For example, medicine um, generally wouldn't be available. Law degrees at top universities like my own generally aren't in clearing either. So it is a case of looking carefully at what programmes are available and making sure that they meet your objectives, as it will typically be those asking for lower grades and at less prestigious universities that are available in clearing. But there are, of course, exceptions to that, and that takes research to prepare for clearing. If you are looking at clearing, the key advice is to act quickly. If you hold back even a few hours, you will miss out on the best places. I can say at my own university, on the rare occasions we've been in clearing, the places are often gone within a couple of hours. It's those students who get on the phone immediately that they've got their results that, that secure the places and that the best places at every university and all the, all the top institutions will have gone quickly in clearing. So don't delay. If you already know that your grades may not be working out that well from your feeling about how the exams have gone, then obviously you can start to plan a bit for clearing and do some initial research. But even if you're feeling relatively confident, it's important to have that plan be in mind and just be ready for clearing should things not quite work out as you hoped. So I hope that's been a useful little overview in 15 minutes of how UCAS works, making your application and writing your personal statement and navigating through the process. As I said, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope it's been a useful presentation for you and I wish you all the best with your future plans. Excellent. So that is the end of Paul McConnell's talk. So for those who would like to connect with Paul, uh, you can connect with him via LinkedIn. So it's Paul McConnell, as I said at the beginning, he's the head of global engagement at Birmingham Law School. That's the University of Birmingham. So I'm now going to head over, hand over to Suzanne. Hopefully, Suzanne, you can hear me. I'm not sure if you can hear me at all, but I'll just, no, you can't hear me. That's a shame. Um, what I'm going to do then, Suzanne, can I, while you figure it out, can I hand over to, I'm going to hand over to Corbena for him to do his talk and give you a little bit more time to figure out yours. So everyone, just bear with me a second. I'm just going to can, uh, communicate with Suzanne with the chat. Just going to. Okay, so Corbena, thank you for joining the call um, earlier. You were due in a few minutes, but hopefully if you're ready, I'd like to hand over to you while Suzanne's still got a few technical if 
um, still got a few technical difficulties. So the next speaker is actually Quibena. Let me get my slides to show you who he is before we delve into it a little bit. So let me, before I hand over to Quibena, I'm just going to give a little bit of context. So let me share this tab instead. Okay, excellent slideshow. Okay. So we've just had Paul McConnell, who is the head of global engagement at Birmingham Law School. We were going to have Suzanne, but as I said, we had a few technical issues. So what I'm going to do is hand over to, I'm going to hand over to Corbena Osai, hopefully I pronounced your surname right, um, who's going to talk about empowering future legal leaders. Um, and then Corbena, once you've finished, um, I'm just going to hand over to Suzanne and I'll be I'll be here, Corbena, supporting you, but in the background, I'll be helping Suzanne work out her technical difficulties. So over to you, Corbena, for your minute talk thank you so you all should fi finish about 247 250 i can hand over to you awesome um i'm just waiting for my camera to turn on i'm not <laughs> sure what's going on my apologies it's okay uh, i'm just going to uh, i'll be in the background as i said because we've uh, it seems that our rangers have had technical issues today even myself when as i was saying to the attendees i literally couldn't hear anybody so when the first speaker was talking i had to tune in via youtube so it was a bit out of sync but Quibena, over to you if you finish in about um 250 um i'll then get food then on so thank you very much all right awesome uh can you all hear and see me okay yes i can all right, fantastic. So um, thanks, Faith Brunel, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, for everyone watching, my name is Corbena. I am currently a MA Law Conversion student at the University of Law. Uh, last year, I graduated from the University of Oxford with a degree in history and politics. And basically, I've been given the opportunity to speak to you about, well, the title I've been given is Empowering Future Legal Leaders. And I really love this topic because of the fact that I think that, especially when it comes to law, something that's quite particular about the UK is that you don't actually need to have studied law or come from a legal background in order to practice. And so, as I've explained earlier, I have a history and politics degree, meaning that I am entering the legal world from a background that has nothing to do with that in a sense. And so the points I've been given to speak to you about are in regards to inspiring a path to success in legal studies, practical tips for academic excellence, and navigating the journey from humanities to law. So I'll be giving you insights and advice in regards to all of those things. But I thought before I go into all of that, I feel like it would be worth explaining kind of my journey and how I've gotten here. So um, for, I, for background, I went to a school that was very underperforming. I went to a school where the pass rate was about 33%, meaning that out of a year group of about 90 students, only one in three actually passed their GCSEs. Um, lots of students were also eligible for free school meals, and there are many students who were on um, education and healthcare plans as well. It was a school um, where the level of disadvantage was quite high. Despite that though, despite myself having received free school meals, and despite coming from a working class background where no one had attended university, I managed to do really well in my GCSEs and I managed to move schools. I moved to a sixth form college where I did A-levels in English literature, history and politics. And um, my sixth form, interestingly, actually offered an opportunity to um, do A-level law. But the reason I didn't go for it was because I knew nothing about law. I didn't feel confident that I would do well in it. And it's a similar reason why I didn't choose to do law at university. I was really lucky during year 12 to have the experience to um, actually do work experience at a law firm for two weeks. So um, this was a Silver Circle law firm in central London. And I got the chance to sit alongside their partners and associates. And I actually got an insight into what a lawyer does. And this was where, I got told that it wasn't actually necessary to study a law degree to practice as a lawyer. So at the time I thought to myself, okay, I know that I know nothing about law, but what do I currently enjoy doing? I mentioned earlier I was doing history and politics for A-level, and I really enjoyed both of those subjects. And as well as that, I also got the opportunity to visit Oxford when I was in year 12, and I absolutely loved the experience. So I thought, okay, 
I'm going to go for that because Oxford offers a history and politics course, which encompasses everything I'm interested in. So why not just go for that? So with that, I applied to Oxford, I applied to history and politics and I got in. And when I got there, um, I was mostly focused on my degree. I wasn't too sure what I actually wanted to do career wise. Um, so I went about, I did quite a lot of different forms of work experience. I interned at the Institute for Government, which is a think tank. Um, I also interned at a charity as well. And I got the opportunity to go to careers fairs and speak to lots of different types of people. And whilst I really enjoyed studying history and politics, I wasn't sure I wanted to go down the political sphere of things. Um, I really enjoyed my internships at the Institute for Government and at Toynbee Hall, but I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was a bit more front facing. I knew I wanted to do something that involved working across different countries because the, um, the internships I did were very UK focused. And so what introduced me to law was when I was in second year and I got involved with the Law Society, I went to one of their events that was being held um, by Freshfields and I got to speak to their trainee solicitors and I really liked the thought of, I really was attracted by the kind of work that they did. So in particular, they explained that they assisted qualified associates and partners on the cases that involved some of the biggest companies in not only the UK but also the world. That was something that also really attracted me and something that also I was really attracted by was the fact that um, they received a lot of training and a lot of development so it didn't seem like they were just stuck doing one thing for 40 plus years. I'm not sure if you guys have heard the saying that you know you're born, you go to school, then you work for 40 years, and then you die. This wasn't like that. It seemed like they were always getting an opportunity to learn something new every single moment. And that was something I really wanted at the time because I wanted to really feel like I could accelerate. And being at Oxford was a great opportunity because it gave me the chance to become vice president of the Law Society, having progressed from a member to then an events officer, to then the head of marketing and then vice president. I wanted to keep that going. So that in a sense is why I decided to do law. Um, in regards to the advice I'd give, how to break into law from let's say a non-law degree, I think it's very different in regards to how you would do it for STEM and how you would do it for humanities. It's actually not that difficult. Um, I have some statistics here and one of the statistics is up to 50% of training solicitors did not study law at university and something law firms actually value is the diversity of thought that comes with, a diff with studying a different degree. So I had a mentor um, at the law firm I did work experience at who actually studied music and on top of that you don't actually even have to already be studying to be in with a chance. The average age of a trainee solicitor is 29 years old, meaning when you leave university, you can really do anything, but then go on to practice law afterwards. You can get a training contract at any age. In regards to what you can do in sixth form in order to get your legal career started, I definitely recommend work experience programs. A really good one is Prime. And Prime is basically, um, a work experience program for year 12 students um you do that in the summer and you're partnered with a law firm you get work experience with them for about two weeks and it's an amazing thing to put on your personal statement i personally uh took part in the smbp as well which is the social mobility business partnership and that once again is not just law firms but also large companies with legal teams and they get um the sixth form students into shadow as well I would say in terms of academics, try and make sure you're on track for a 2-1 whilst you're in university. I'd say A-level grades are not as important because a lot of firms are getting rid of the A-levels requirement. Um, but do try and make sure you get a 2-1 because law firms, training contracts are very, very competitive and most people are going to have excellent grades. So you need to make sure that you check that box. But in terms of what can make you stand out, it's not necessarily about having the idea of being a lawyer. You need to actually understand that you know what it entails. And I haven't got enough time to speak about that in this talk, but definitely try and get as much 
non-formal experience as you can. Forage has lots of online opportunities and chances for you to experience what a training solicitor actually does in terms of work. Also, Legal Cheek does virtual vacation schemes which are completely free and offer networking opportunities like some of the ones you've experienced today, for example. And on top of that, non-legal work experience is also very valued so even though i interned at a think tank and at a charity i've also interned at a pharmaceutical company as well as a fast moving consumer goods company but this stuff is all really good experience because they show that you you understand how the commercial law works if you want to go into a commercial law firm um in regards to postgrad obviously not necessary to do if you feel like it would benefit you and if you have the means to do it i'd say by all means go for it but on the other hand i'd say the law profession is becoming a lot more open with the introduction of the sqe meaning you no longer actually need to do a law conversion um that being said a lot of law firms will sponsor conversion courses anyway so that you get a good footing um if you have studied a non-law degree and finally, one thing I'll say is that there are actually law firms that are actively looking for more STEM graduates. Um, you can research this in your own time, but they actually offer sector specific training contracts in things such as life sciences and technology. So if you do have an interest in science, if you have studied a STEM degree, there is a very good pathway into law from that aspect. And also degree apprenticeships are on the rise for those who are studying um, at sixth form and I'm not sure if they want to go to university degree apprenticeships are a really good way of getting insight into the legal sector not only do you not have any debt and you study for a degree part-time the law firm will pay for it you have a salary of about 25k and you end up with a job at the end of it so those are the tips and advice I would give I want to say thank you so much to Faith Bernal for giving me the opportunity to speak and um, hopefully I haven't gone over time. Thank you so much once again. If you want to connect with me, uh, my LinkedIn is truly my name. I'm my I'm open for any further advice. Thank you, thank you. That is excellent, Corbena. Thank you very much for giving. Yes, yes, that's clap for, for, for Corbena and for all the speakers as well. Who forgot to clap yeah. for. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, thank you. That was very, very insightful, really, to speak about your personal journey as well. You know, speaking about that was very, very insightful, and I have no doubt that it would have been very, very well received by all of the attendees who, who are currently here and those who will um, tune in later on. So, thank you very much, Corbena, and we will definitely. Um, you keep in touch as well so thank you so much again and you've been perfectly in time literally right down to the minute you're perfectly on time so thank you very much and for really for squeezing in so much information but really that was in so much depth in such a short space of time i truly have been have, have really found a lot of great information from what you've just said so thank you very much and i wish you all the best with your legal journey thanks a lot Excellent. So I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Corbena. Excellent. I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker whose technical difficulties have now been solved. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to hand over to Suzanne Reese. I'm going to share her slides now. Suzanne, over to you while I get your slides ready. Thank you very much, Faith Bernal. Um, well, we're going to think about what you need in order to succeed. And clearly, um, if you just bring up my first slide. Is that the one you need or is it the one before? I, I can't see any slides. Oh. I, I, can, I can just see you. Um, <laughs> hang on. This has been pinned. So if I check, can I confirm? That, that anyone else can see the slides can anyone else see the slides bethany can you see the slides yes yeah, she can see the slides okay, okay don't worry Suzanne. The, the slides are there this is um at the moment okay. the slide is the one with the tips for success okay so um let me just get my slides up then because i thought i was going to view them on the screen um just bear with me for two seconds they are no somewhere problem. quite nearby because i've looked at them recently <laughs> and they're just opening up let me just get them onto the right screen excellent okay 
so our brief talk is going to be about empowering the next generation of legal professionals and our first slide study tips and exercises for success so you've decided that you want to be a lawyer you are embarking on those early steps so for many people this is about doing the sqe so the solicitors qualifying examinations part one and part two and then having the necessary qualifying work experience to actually be admitted as a solicitor so i think the one thing i would say to students is this is a long journey and you have to prepare yourself at the start of the journey there will be times when you'll be excited it will be interesting there will be times when it's challenging and there may even be times where you think to yourself is it really worth the stress the anxiety the money the difficulties that i've encountered but you've got to take the long view and whenever i talk to students who come into my office or talk to me and say suzanne this is happening, you know, I really feel demoralised or unhappy about something. I always remind them, why are you taking this journey? I want that qualification. I want to be a solicitor. And the only way you can get to that end journey is by taking the long view, going through this process. So it's important to be realistic. The journey will not always be happy. It will not, not always be good for you but it's the process that you need to get through in order to qualify. And in those moments where you think, should I be pressing ahead? It's the thing that will say, do you know what? I'm just gonna take another 30 minutes to make sure I understand this process. I'm just gonna take another 30 minutes to make sure I finish off that task and complete it to the best of my ability. And it will be those little extra bits that you take along this journey that means that you get to that journey and you're standing there with that little qualification certificate saying that you're admitted to the legal profession as a solicitor in England and Wales and you'll it, you know you'll forget about the difficulties and the journey will have been worth it so take that long view nothing is quick nothing is easy that's worth having but you will get there and then that leads me on to attitude there are different types of characters and people some people will be um broken down by criticism by feedback other people see it as an opportunity to learn and something to build on and move forward so it's your glass half empty or half full be a person who's got a glass that is half full every time you get something wrong i say to my students it is an opportunity to learn and to get better and to understand why you should not do what you did and how to direct your learning in a slightly different way. So see every everything that you're doing, whether you get great grades or bad grades, as an opportunity to learn. And the most impressive students I always had were those students who were getting the top grades and still going, but Suzanne, how can I get an extra couple of marks? How can I push it just a little bit further? Not in a, I want perfection, but I want to be the best that I can. And that attitude of how can I get better, it's not focusing on the grade, how can I do better is an important attitude to have at the beginning in the middle and at the end and to be honest as you go into your professional career that attitude of how can i get better is what will take you to partnership level and beyond you may run your own company you may run a public company but it's that i want to just push those boundaries a bit further with attitude comes resilience of course things are not always going to be rosy you're not always going to be happy there will be times when you are down and that's only natural but it's about okay i'm down today but tomorrow i'm about dusting myself off and i'm bouncing back that consistent resilience think about the hurdles that you've overcome in life to get to where you are today what have you overcome that is your resilience it tells you that I may not always have been on top, but I always get back to the top where I want to be. And that resilience is essential on a journey to qualification. 
feedback again it reinforces the idea about the attitude and the resilience some people want to focus on the grade the feedback they read they want to throw move it to one side and then move on to the next exercise no feedback is there for a reason it's how to improve and that's not just reading it and thinking yeah yeah i understand that feedback is about actually let me go back and do that piece of work incorporating that feedback does it look better has it improved that's when you know that you have embraced the feedback that you've been given and that you've moved that little bit further along that pathway to getting better. Routine. Everyone starts off at the beginning of a course. I'm going to do eight hours of study. I'm going to make sure that I get the perfect grades. OK, that is a good ambition. But reality is keeping to a routine is probably the biggest thing that will keep you on track. So be realistic, set a routine that's achievable and stick to the routine. It's a bit like your gym routine. If you think about, oh, I've got to go to the gym, game over. It's oh, it's X time, gym time, grab your bag and just go. You don't even want to be thinking about it, almost on automatic pilot. So realistic, achievable routine. Rather than saying, I'm going to do eight hours of study, is there one hour every day that you can do a specific item of study? And then if you get some extra time, of course, you can build on it. But have your core routine that you're doing every single day. I've been doing a 40 day meditation. I can't tell you how many times I've started the 40 days. I never get to the end of 40 days. But you know what? I come back and I start it again. And one day I will get to the end of that 40 day routine. But the fact is I'm building in some routine. OK, it's not consistently 40 days, but it's routine. And that's what you need to do. You won't always be perfect. There'll be those days where you'll say, actually, I can't do it today. It's snowing. I don't want to go to the gym. But if six of the days you do that routine, that will get you on your journey. And then I want to talk about what people don't always think about. They think of studying is about the, the knowledge that they're going to transfer into their brains. They think about the ultimate goal, but they don't think about the environment, the way they sleep, the way they eat, the way they exercise. You do not learn in isolation. If you're not sleeping, your brain activity is not going to be as sharp your critical analysis skills aren't going to work as effectively if you're eating junk food i'm not even going to tell you where that junk food comes from but if you're not eating healthy food that will have an impact on your physical performance and how you feel if you're not exercising you don't have to go to the gym just go for a walk uh, walk the dog, anything that you find enjoyable that is a break from study and a break from work, then you're not refreshing your mental uh, 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 state, you're not physically refreshing yourself and eventually you find yourself in a sort of slump where you find it difficult to study. So setting ambitions, goals, being resilient, being open to feedback and having a good routine are supported by the fundamentals, sleep, eat, exercise. And I suppose the one thing I'd say after you've done that, have a little bit of time to relax because you can't work and study for the whole 24 hours in a day. So relaxing is also important. So take time to listen to some music, take time to have a chat with a friend and that will support your long-term goal. So let's move now on the next slide into the specifics about study skills that I think will actually help you to focus. Um, for, for me, location, location, location. It's not about buying a property. This is about where am I studying? You cannot study in an environment where you need to concentrate and think and there's chaos going on around you. Depending on the task, you need an environment that is comfortable, that is light, that is quiet so that you can study. There may be types of work that you can do 
where you can sit in a quiet cafe, not at peak times and do some work, but choose your location carefully. When you need to do that detailed studying and that important memorising, a cafe is not the place. If you're doing some sort of light refreshing, so you're listening to a lecture and the background environment is really background because you've got headphones on, then it may be okay to do it in a cafe or on the way to work on the train or, or on your commute in some other way. But detailed studying, quiet location, focus. And uh, you cannot underestimate the importance of location. If a location isn't working for you, change it. So don't always use the same location. People sometimes get bored. They find a particular location doesn't make them feel happy or particularly wanting to study change your location choose a different room in the house um find somewhere outside of the house there are still some public libraries left that are nice and quiet especially in london there's some amazing libraries um so find a library in your city or town that is good for you and work in a location that works for you time time when you study is important not um the amount of time here we're looking at the time of day. There are different tasks at different times of the day that are better for you to study. So for me, I'm a detailed person in the morning. I don't do details in the afternoon or late at night. I, I don't even do late at night because I just fall asleep. Some people think they do their best work late at night. I would really ask them to think about that because after you've worked all day, after you've done whatever you've done all the afternoon, are you really at your best at 11 o'clock at night? Most people are not at their best at 11 o'clock at night. So rather than pushing things to the end of the day, think about little periods of time, little pockets of time that you can find during the day. It's a half an hour that you can take at your lunch time um, to do something. It's a half an hour at the end of the day but before you get into all that evening stuff that you can take to steal and try to do things at a time of day that works for you so if you are a detailed person when during the day are you most focused do the things that require the less focus later on in the day that works for most people so it may be that when you have to study your workbook you are studying that during the day before work very early maybe at lunch time or early afternoon you may be listening to a lecture which requires less intense study in the evenings but not at 12 o'clock at night go to bed at 12 o'clock at night get up early and focus then because I don't think you take in as much late at night there are always exceptions to every rule so I, I do say that sometimes there are people who are fantastic late at night but you know if you are or you're not focus don't kid yourself that you're focusing when you're not focusing if you're if it's not going in change the task if it's not going in change the subject if it's not going in it may be time to get up walk away do something else, have a break and come back to it maybe 30 minutes, an hour later when your mind is telling you they're receptive to learning. Your brain's very good at telling you, I'm not interested in doing this at the moment. I want to do something else. You can't fight it. Give it a break. Do something else and then come back to it. How do you record your learning? Some people take notes. Other people prefer audio notes. Some people like diagramming pictures, other people like charts. As you've gone through your educational career, you have selected a particular preference for how you like to learn. Don't fight it. Use it to help you through the process of learning. And so some very short, brief, quick study tips for you. And then my one little note that I want to leave you with, which is a quote by one of my favourite authors, Maya Angelou um, and she says in this quote uh, which which is one from one of her famous books uh, Still I Rise you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies you may trod me in the very dirt but still like dust I rise and that's what we come back to what is my long-term objective I don't care what anyone says I don't care what happens I have my eyes on that prize 
and I'm going to keep going for it. So I encourage you to not listen, not focus on negativity, find the positivity and keep your eyes on a long term goal. Excellent. Excellent, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Although we had some technical issues, it was really worth it at the end. So thank you so much for your great insight and information about how to study, how to revise. And these are tips that I personally will take as a master's student. So thank you very much, Suzanne, for your time, for your enthusiasm and for your energy. Thanks very much, Faith Bernal, for all your good work in organising this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. So that was Suzanne. Bye, Suzanne. Thank Bye. you again. That was Suzanne Rees, um, as we've just shared her slides there. The next speaker, the next and final speaker is Dr. Inez Brown, um, who's going to be speaking on From the Boardroom to Legal Empowerment to share her journey. I'm just going to pop this slide up with a lovely photograph that she sent me. So here it is. So Dr. Inez, I'm going to hand over to you um, to basically to just be the last speaker today, just to talk about your journey. And then once you finish in your 10, you know, your 10 or so minutes, I will then come and conclude today's event. Thanks a lot. Okay, Faith, thank you so much for inviting me to um, speak today. It's a pleasure and I just want to commend you for everything that you do in empowering students to strive for better. So Faith asked me to share my journey. I've been a lawyer for, um, I think it's just under 22 years. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to share with you is you've got to have a purpose. Your purpose can be your goal, your dream, whatever you call it, you must have a purpose. So if you want to be a solicitor, if you want to be a barrister, that is what you must focus on. And the previous speaker said that you shouldn't let anything um, take you off course for your goal. And I would say that you really need to do that. So from the age of 12, I knew that I wanted to be a solicitor. I, my best friend lived next door to the school that we um, attended. And so I would go home with her at lunchtime and watch this program called Crown Court. And I was fascinated by these men who were wearing robes and wigs and then hearing them either defend or prosecute um, someone who was on trial for murder or for fraud. And I was totally mesmerized by this. And I said to my friend, I'm going to become a solicitor. I remember mentioning it to um, some of my teachers. And at that time, not many of the children went on to get a professional career. So I think they, they didn't try to discourage me, but I don't think that they thought that I would make it. And I was a bit of a lazy child in that I knew that I could work really, really hard, but at the time I would settle for just a pass. All I need to do is just pass. Don't be like me, work much, much harder. I had so many balls that I was juggling. Um, you know, I'm from a single parent family and I was trying to help mom with different things, but you've got to really, really work hard. So I focused and I was determined. Coming from a West Indian background, when I um, finished school, I told my mom that I'm going to do my A-levels and go on to university to study law. And she said, no, what you're going to do is become a secretary first. And I was absolutely gutted because that is not what I wanted to do. But she said that it would teach me some really key skills. It would teach me interpersonal skills and it would teach me organizational skills. And if for any reason I was unable to secure a training contract, I always had the legal secretarial work to fall back on. So I eventually did it. I, I followed her advice and I studied at Solihull College in Birmingham and was offered a um, week's work experience at a big law firm. They're now Pinsent Masons, but they were called Pinsents at the time. And they were so impressed with my typing abilities and my, um, could do shorthand as well, that they offered me a job. And so I remained at um, Pinsents for a while, bought a house and life took over. But I never forgot my purpose, which was to become a solicitor. And eventually I um, went to university part-time, 
while I worked full time and that's how I did my um, degree, part time degree, law degree and also my legal practice course part time and I eventually qualified. But the reason why it was important for me to um, go down that route at the time, there were not many people of colour who were lawyers um, in the big law firms and I had made a number of contacts in the legal sector and so one of the partners that I'd worked for at Pinson's he was now at another firm and suggested that I should apply and I wanted to make sure that I was able to get the job on merit and I did I did my training contract there were some struggles along the way and I think that we will all face struggles but we've got to learn how to overcome the difficulties that we experience and try and see if we can overcome the hurdles and see the opportunities and thankfully I then um, became a solicitor in my own right I became a specialist in the field of clinical negligence and there is even a case that I did that changed law in relation to how locum doctors and nurses enter the UK. So that was my journey into um, the legal sector. As I said, you've got to have purpose. You also need to have perseverance because there are so many things that are going to come in your way. You're going to be faced with discouragement. You're going to be faced with a lack of finance. You're going to be told by others that you can't do this. And you need to persevere through and make sure that you're focused and that nothing, nothing at all takes you away from your dream and your goal. Faith asked me to talk about the different routes into um, the legal sector. So I entered the legal sector as a legal secretary and then studied part time. You have the paralegal route that you can take. Um, and I know that they do do paralegal courses as well, where you can do the course, you can apply for work experience and you can get in to the law firm that way. And more and more firms, even though they're offering um, young people training contracts, they are allowing people to come through the paralegal route. Another route is Silex. So that's the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. Um, you could go into a law firm as a junior and um, an office junior doing, I, I don't know, marketing, um, finance, um, law, even as a legal junior where you're assisting with the photocopying and the mundane tasks. But while you're doing that, you're learning and you're observing how a law firm actually runs. And when they sit with you at your appraisal, they will ask you what your career pathway is. What do you want to do in the next couple of years? And you might decide that you want to become a chartered legal exec. So that's where you are working in a department, but you're studying at the same time. They've introduced the SQE, so you no longer do your training contract. Um, and you can get experience from different firms you could be a conveyancer you could go into a law firm you may have different routes into um, the legal profession but whatever route you take make sure that you work really hard and that you have the perseverance to continue once you get into a law firm and i would suggest that what you should do is work experience some of the smaller firms will allow you to go in and work and i remember there's probably about four um paralegals that i introduced to my firm when i was in private practice but what i said to them was that they should contact the firm and tell them that they want to do work experience during their summer i advised them to give up their entire summer break and what i would do is expose them to different departments and one of them um, would hopefully offer them a paralegal position and that happened in all of the um, cases that i or individuals that i brought into the firm that has changed they changed the way that they do work experience now and it's very very competitive i'm pleased to say that all of the um young um black and ethnic minority students that I brought into the firm, they're either qualified solicitors, they're associates, or they're just starting their um, training contract. So it really pays to give up your time to do work experience or make sure that there is something 
unique and different about you that you can add to your CV so that you're doing extracurricular stuff. It may be that you are um, volunteering for a charity. You could be working at a law centre who desperately need assistance. You could be working at a call centre where you're advising um, abused women absolutely anything that you could be doing but you've got to make sure that your cv stands out from those who are applying and that there is something unique about you once you do make it into the legal um into a legal firm don't give up even if it's a paralegal role or a junior role or a legal secretarial role, keep pushing on, keep talking to people, keep making contacts. I would say that it's really, really important for you to network. They have so many networking opportunities for students. So you need to definitely um, make sure that you get onto the networking circuit because you don't know who you're going to meet and that one conversation could change your life. So this is just practical things that I'm trying to give you. When you do become a solicitor or a barrister or a silex, whichever one you want to do, uh, just on the silex point, the chartered legal executive route, once you qualify, and I think it takes four years for you to do the course, after you've completed a year as a chartered legal exec, you can then write to the um, Law Society and the SRA, and then you can convert your certificate and become a um, solicitor so that is i would say a much quicker route in than some of the other routes and you're already in the firm but make sure that you're inclusive do not forget those who have given you a helping hand into the firm who have supported you who have mentored you it's very very important that you don't forget that and the reason i say that is when I became president of Birmingham Law Society in 2020, um, there is a lead in to the presidential route. So I was the deputy vice president, then I was the president, and then I, sorry, the deputy vice, the vice, and then the president. And during the deputy vice period, which was in 2018, I started to think about the initiatives that I would like to run. And I explained to you that I come from a single parent group background, grew up on a council estate, and I know the struggles that I experienced to get into the legal um, profession, the costs of the legal practice course, and the costs of the SQE are very expensive. I thought that they were going to make it cheaper, but they haven't. So I decided to set up a diversity inclusion scheme. And what I wanted was to make sure that anyone from a disadvantaged background would be able to apply for this scheme where they would get a financial scholarship um, from a university. So there are two universities that I approached, uh, University of Law and also Wolverhampton University. And I spoke to them about this scholarship. They agreed and provided a scholarship for two students. But I didn't just want the students to be helped financially. Um, as students, you need support with letter writing skills, interview techniques, presentation skills, and also work experience. So I spoke to two law firms to see whether or not they would be willing to provide a mentor for those students for a year. We are now on our 10th student at the Law Society that we have helped and every one of them have secured a training contract. So check out Birmingham Law Society website for the diversity inclusion scheme. And I believe that the Law Society of England and Wales also offers a inclusion scheme. So, so check those things out because you'll get the right support that you um, need. I would also say that once you become a lawyer, barrister, whatever route you take, make sure that you enjoy. You enjoy what you do. Um, try and block out any negativity and focus on your career, your ambition, where you want to get to as a um, solicitor. It may be that you want to become a partner. So you have to work hard and demonstrate that you deserve this. If you want to become a barrister, it will be a pupil, 
barrister and then a KC. So you want to make sure that you are um, impressing whoever you need to impress and block out the negativity. You have to be disciplined. You've got to be focused. You've got to be resilient. And anyone who would like advice from me, I'm happy for Faith to share my contact details. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm really approachable. And for me, it's all about giving back, nurturing and helping young people through the legal profession that I love so very much. So thank you very much. It was a quick stop tour um, through the route, different routes into the legal profession and also my career. And I'm at the top of my profession mm. now. And I, I just love what I do. Thank you, Ines. That was absolutely amazing. So inspirational as well. I could really feel the passion. I could really feel your care for other people to succeed and to remember those who are, um, you know, you know, and think about those who have those obstacles, who have those challenges. I think that is very, very commendable. So thank you, Dr. Ines Brown, past president of the Birmingham Law Society, for stopping by and just giving you, uh, giving us a with a top tour. Thank you very much. So thank you, Ines. You're free, you're free to go. I know you have other commitments. So thank you very much to everybody today who has tuned in to um to, to this year's legally empowered navigating your journey into law with faith brunel's insights i'm faith brunel and just before we end today i just want to run through through a few slides just to kind of give you a bit of kind of next steps now feel free to join our mailing list which is accessible uh, through the link in our bio so head to our instagram and you can join our mailing list as well so feel free to do that and uh, if you join our mailing list as dr inez has just mentioned i've been given the go ahead to share her details and she is somebody who can really really give you a lot of advice and some support for those who are aspiring legal professionals um, as well and then just finally going through moving past that our next event is on exam wellness navigating exams again headline sponsor logos um, headline sponsor uh, headline sponsor is Logos rather Logos um, West Midlands CIC we got there in the end um, and that is May 10th at 1 p.m. BST and I will keep you all updated finally feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn at Faith Brunel Pommel and you can connect with me and drop me a message that you met me today through Legally Empowered and finally do scan the QR code to connect and follow us on social media at Faith to Be Insights on TikTok Instagram Facebook Pinterest and many more um, uh, and here, feel free to follow us on our LinkedIn page at Faith Brunel's Insight. So that is the conclusion of Legally Empowered. We finished slightly earlier. If you have any questions for any of the speakers that we got, that, that spoke today, so Sandy Monroe, Paul McConnell, Suzanne Reese, and, and then we had um, Ines Brown and Quibena Osai, feel free to reach out to them through LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Remember, it's not an event, it's a journey. And I wish you all a wonderful and a really great week. Thanks, everybody. And I'm going to stop the live stream now.